Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for this important discussion tonight. So we have four presenters and a lot of things to talk about. I'm going to give a very brief introduction, and then we can get into the meat of the program. Of course, have questions to ask. I'm sure a lot of you do have questions. I'll try to help keep an eye on the chat too and type as uh, people are talking. Here tonight to talk about Black non-religious Americans and the recent report that was put out by American atheists and Black non-believers. My name is Debbie Goddard. I'm the Vice President of Programs at American Atheists. My background is in organizing and activism with different kinds of groups. I previously worked at the Center for Inquiry, leading the outreach programs and directing African Americans for Humanism. I'm joined by Allison Gill, who is American Atheists Vice President for Legal and Policy. She manages the organization's federal and state advocacy for religious equality and litigation activities to protect the separation of religion and government. Mandisa Thomas is also here, a native of New York City. She is the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers. She also serves on the boards for American Atheists and the American Humanist Association, previously also for Foundation Beyond Belief, Secular Coalition for America, and the Reason Rally Coalition and Sandria Hall, who is a mental health counselor and life co coach. Her practice is exclusively virtual, servicing clients across the globe. She focuses on life transitions and religious trauma. A preacher's kid from the Bible Belt South, she faced firsthand the difficulties in leaving a dogmatic religious foundation to learning how to stand in one's own truth. That's very relevant for the things that we're going to be discussing tonight related to the report that came out last month. And we'll start things off with Alison Gill. Thank you so much, Debbie. And we'll start off by making sure I can show this, share the slides. So let me try that first here. How does that look? If you're just nodding, I cannot hear you. Is that is that good? Is there a slide? Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. All right, beautiful. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, let me proceed then. So uh, just to go before I start, let me just talk about the agenda. So first, I'll be starting by talking about data on Black non-religious people in the new report. And then uh, Sandria will talk about mental health and leaving religion. Then um, um, Mendisa will talk about Black non-believers and their work to build strong Black non-religious communities. And then finally, Debbie will talk about the recommendations and I just misspelled that, but the recommendations for community building and organizing that are from the report. So please ignore my minor typo. Uh, moving forward. So data on Black non-religious people. So before I talk about the actual data from the report, I want to just talk about why this is critical and why we need this information. There is overall just a, a lack of data about non-religious people in this country. And that's largely because federal surveys that collect data on all sorts of issues do not collect data on non-religious people. And that's true for all non-religious people, but it's especially true for black non-religious people, which are of course a, a minority of a minority. So they're a smaller portion of the whole non-religious community. And without this information, it's hard for us to know exactly where there are disparities when it comes to our population and things like education and healthcare and every, uh, every other aspect of our lives. Um, there are some studies done by Pew Research Center and uh, PR, PRI or Public Re Religion Research Inst Institute and other types of um, organizations, but those are more focused on like the number of non-religious people in looking at the broader spectrum of, of all the religious people in the country. And they don't dive as deeply as we would like to see in areas regarding discrimination or stigma or the impact that has on people's lives. So that's why we conceive this survey is to really get at those latter issues and understand how people are affected in this country who are non-religious, what their daily lives, lives are like, what issues they face, what issues are important to them, and um, you know, is there discrimination and that sort of thing in America against non-religious people? So um, why is data collection important? Well, the fact is because of the way discourse works in our society without data, non-religious people and the issues they face are invisible. It's data is important to be able to sort of back up what you're saying 
um, useful for advocacy, for making sure that services can be targeted, for understanding what the community's needs actually are, and for seeking grants and funding so you can actually run programs that are well targeted towards the communities you're trying to serve. So uh, data is critically important for all of those reasons, and that's one of the re major reasons why we did this, this big survey. So, you know, I mentioned that, you know, even among non-religious people, of course, Black non-religious people are a minority of that group, but there are so many stereotypes in our society about Black people and how they are all religious, for example, that often when we're talking about non-religious communities, even more so than in other places, Black uh, non-religious people are overlooked or made invisible. And there, this is for a variety of reasons. So I thought I'd just go through them very briefly to help understand and set some context, because uh, it really does, it plays an important role in this report and the reasons why this data looks the way it does. So I mentioned there's lack of available data, but there's also the stereotypes about Black people being non-religious plays a, a major part in this. There's a lack of, study of non-religious people generally. But then again, there's even fewer people studying sub-religions, uh, uh, sub-populations of non-religious people. So there's not very much research out there that's focused on like non-religious women, Black non-religious people, and other sub-populations of non-religious people. And that's one of the reasons we don't have a ton of information. A, a lot of but the information we do have shows that a lot of Black non-religious people use different words to describe their beliefs, or they are more likely to conceal their non-religious identities. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But basically, um, there was research that shows that only about one in four Black people that say that, they, that there is no God, so these are people that believe in, in no God, identify as atheists, one in four, compared to about three in five white respondents who say there is no God who identifies atheists. So that's quite a difference. And so it's it's not about their beliefs, it's about their usage of the term atheist. And that's just one example. But there, you know, we, and our, our data was actually similar. Our research showed that black participants were less likely to identify with the term atheist and more likely to use other terms. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get further into it. But this also means that Black people are less likely to know another Black atheist, that is, uh, another Black person that uses the word atheist to describe their identity. And it's been shown that, that knowing other people that use the term atheist to describe themselves is like a key factor to a person identifying as an atheist. So, you know, atheism and atheists are very stigmatized um, in our society. So it's hard to adopt a stigmatized identity, particularly if you don't know anybody else who's not an atheist. So having friends and other people that sort of are similar to you and people that use that term really does make a difference and makes people more likely to identify that way. Um, so that, that can be a really key factor. And for communities like, like Black people in America who already face marginalization, adopting an additional stigmatized identity such as atheists can have greater social cost. It can have, uh, and that can cause people to be less likely to adopt that term even if they believe, for example, in no God. So that, that's a really important thing to understand. And then lastly, the racial dynamics in secular communities can be very off-putting. I mean, there's, there's been, you know, I think it's well understood and you'll see in, in our report and our data that, um, you know, the local groups a lot of the time and the community overall is dominated by white people and also dominated not dominated, but skewed towards men. So it tends to be white men more so than other groups who identify explicitly as atheists and also who are um, predominant in the local groups and communities. And so that can be um, very challenging, that sort of racial dynamic, and it can cause um, you know, issues to sort of people that want to more so engage with local groups. So those are just some of the reasons, and I'm sure we'll go more into it, especially as Debbie talks more about recommendations for moving forward, but I thought it was important to understand like why there's such a lack of data, particularly about this population. So let's talk about what we do, uh, the survey first. So we conducted the National US Secular Survey in 2019, and we had originally hoped for a small survey of about 10,000 people, but we, we worked together with all the other secular, uh, not all, but uh, many of the major national secular organizations, including Black nonbelievers and many others, to get the word out there as broadly as possible. And we were just overwhelmed by the response. There was nearly 34,000 people across the country that participated in the, in the survey. So it was the largest ever survey of non-religious people in, in the US. 
And of this survey, nearly 900 were, were Black, and that's about 2.7% of the full um, of the full survey sample. Now that is a very small fraction. And you know, one of the things we were really trying to figure out is how can we really make sure we're engaging and getting as broad a, a cross section of the black non-religious community as possible. We don't know, that's part of the problem is we don't actually know how big that community is. So it's hard to say how, um, you know, how much we're capturing or how much people were sort of, if the, if the percentages skew one way or another. There is some data showing that national population surveys, for example, from Pew Research, show that about 3% of atheists and agnostics are Black. So this is somewhat in line with that finding. But I still think, you know, if we ever, when we next time we do a national survey like this, we really have to double down and make sure we're do over-representing uh, Black participants to make sure we can get as strong a data as possible. Um, I think it's also important to note that our survey is not nationally representative of all non-religious people. It's a convenience sample, so that means people self-select to participate and they sort of spread the word to people they know through the various different channels. And so um, it's best used to look at trends within the community, differences between groups, and interests of groups rather than trying to say like all non-religious people or all Black atheists believe this, because that's not what the survey shows us. It's not what the results show us. Okay, so the report is available, and here's our lovely cover, available at uh, secularsurvey.org, right there, and it's of course free online, and we encourage you to check it out. I'm going to touch on different issues from the report, but I'd encourage you to, we go much more in depth in the report, so I encourage you to take a look at it when you're able. Um, and we also have, you know, pretty graphics, and one of my favorite parts is we actually have quotes from people um, you know, who participated in the survey and talked about their own experiences, which I really feel helps give some, you know, understanding about what people are experiencing and some flavor to help us understand like what these st statistics mean. So I, I prefer to include those sorts of, uh, of things when possible in these types of reports. About the sample. So compared to other participants in the U.S. Secular Survey, the Black participants were on average younger. They were more likely to be LGBTQ. They were more likely to live in the South and in urban areas, and they were likely to have identified, <clears throat> excuse me, as non-religious for less time. <clears throat> excuse me. It's likely to have identified as non-religious for less time than other participants. So this chart, we have two charts here. The one on the left talks about primary religious, non-religious identity. So we see that over 50% of the Black non-religious participants identified as atheists, so 52.6%. However, that's actually less than other participants who are, who are not Black, <clears throat> who were, um, Black participants were nearly one-fifth or 18% less likely to identify as atheists, and about one-third more likely to primarily identify as non-religious, or agnostic compared to other participants. So as I was saying in the beginning, there's a difference in rate of identification. We saw that among our respondents as well. On the right side, we looked, we asked uh, participants to talk about the religiosity of their communities. And like other, there was no real difference between black participants and other participants. Um, and basically in the communities they lived in, in terms of religiosity, about one third of each um, of all the participants, including the black participants, identified as living in a very religious community. And that has a lot of repercussions, which we'll talk about more. So one of the most important things I wanted to look at is family experiences. So on the left side, we have a chart that looks at family rejection. And we compare, um, you know, this is only for uh, basically people whose parents knew about their non-religious identity when they were under 25. So we're looking at the rejection by, by families who know about one's non-religious identity before the age of 25. And we see that across um, the categories, the Black participants were more likely to have unsupportive families than other participants, uh, significantly more likely to have very unsupportive families. Well, first of all, I should note that nearly half 
of black non-religious participants said that their parents were not aware of their non of their non-religious beliefs before age 25. So that's quite high. Um, nearly half of parents, so 46.5%, were somewhat or very unsupportive of black non-religious participants. Um, and about that means that they were about 50% more likely to have unsupportive parents than other participants, which is just a really marked difference between this group and other groups, which I think is worth noting, because that has a really significant impact on people in their psychological development. Uh, a significant impact that those, those who experienced negative events with their, within their families because of their non-religious beliefs were one third more likely to screen positive for depression. So when we saw that there was significant conflict because of their non-religious beliefs in the family, they were more likely to encounter and have depression. Black participants with very unsupportive parents were also about 14% more lonely than those with very supportive parents. On the other hand, those Black uh, participants with supportive parents were less lonely and significantly less likely to conceal their non-religious beliefs. So they were more open about their beliefs uh, later in life if they had more supportive um, you know, family. And that makes a difference too, because concealment of one's non-religious beliefs is associated with increased loneliness and more likely depression. Um, I also wanted to note on the right side, we asked about religious expectations. So how, uh, you know, how, how, what sort of expectations your family had growing up? Did they have strict expectations, relaxed expectations, or no expectations, basically? And we found that among Black participants, about one in five had very strict religious upbringings compared to one in seven among other participants. This is especially true in very religious communities. And Black non-religious participants raised with very strict religious expectations were about 20% more lonely than those with no religious um, expectations. So that's really interesting. And I, I think that um, Sandria is gonna talk more about uh, strict expectations as well in her section. So I think that fits in well. So in this next chart, I wanted to talk a little bit about stigma. We asked to determine how much stigma non-religious people face in their daily lives. We asked about some common, what are called microaggressions or some common experiences that people have that sort of other non-religious people to make them feel like they're separate or othered or not part of the community or, or lesser. Like for example, we asked um, how often people feel like they have, they are asked or feel pressure to pretend that they are religious or how often people are to have told them that they are not a good person because they're secular or non-religious. And by asking those together, we're able to create a, what's called a scale or an assessment of how much stigma that the person has seen. Um, based on their experiences. And so we can look at stigma and how it compares across different groups and different circumstances. So overall, you know, um, stigma was slightly higher, not very higher, but slightly higher for Black non-religious people because of their non-religious beliefs than, than other participants in the survey. However, it was much higher in very religious communities with those participants encountering about 35% more stigma than in less religious communities. And those who experienced more stigma were also more lonely. So it was very clear that increased stigmatization uh, was associated with more loneliness. We also asked about concealment or how often people conceal their non-religious identity in various different aspects of their lives. So for example, with extended family, with people at work, uh, people at school, friends and acquaintances, strangers. And we found overall, um, black participants concealed their beliefs slightly more altogether than other participants, but they were significantly more likely to conceal their, their, their non-religious beliefs from specific groups like members of their immediate family and their extended family. So more than half, for example, concealed uh, their non-religious beliefs, um, I think it's mostly or always with extended family. So that's uh, quite significant, it's broader, it's more so than, than other populations that we looked at. 
Um, black participants were also 42% more likely to always conceal their non-religious beliefs in three or more areas of their lives, so that in these cases, they might have few or no places but which they feel comfortable to talk about their beliefs. So they were more likely to conceal their beliefs across broad parts of their, of their lives than other participants. We also saw about 16% more consumers in very religious communities. Why is this important? Well, significant research demonstrates that concealment can lead people to feel a lack of authenticity, to have difficulty establishing close ties with others, and to experience more social isolation and have lower, psycho lower feelings of belonging and psychological well being. And our data so shows that concealment is associated with several types of negative outcomes among participants, including loneliness and risk for depression. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about psychological impact in the next slide. So here we have uh, two charts. The one on the left looks at concealment and how it relates to loneliness. And we see that as you know, the, the concealment scale increases, um, it's associated with an increase overall in loneliness. And so that's what I was just mentioning. It's concealment can result in you know, lack of um, you know, worse psychological outcomes in that way. On the right side, we talked about increased likely depression um, and discrimination. So this is a chart showing that basically people who encountered uh, discrimination because of their non-religious identity in various different areas of their lives were more likely to encounter, I mean, more likely to, to experience likely depression than other participants, especially, for example, people that encountered it in substance abuse services, in public benefits, housing, mental health services, so areas that are really critical to their well-being. If there's discrimination that they encounter because of their non-religious beliefs, it can be can have a really devastating impact. Let's just see if there's anything else I want to point out here. So um, Black participants who always conceal their identity were about 36.6 more lonely than those who rarely did so. So that's one of the um, things worth noting. Also, Overall, Black participants had a higher rate of depression than other participants. It was about 1.6 times as likely. And this is, was especially true for Black non-religious youth ages 18 to 24, who were about three times as likely to be depressed as older Black participants. So we saw higher overall for Black participants likely depression and much higher for Black non-religious young people ages 18 to 24. Um, unfortunately, the minimum age we could really do in the survey was 18. I would really would have loved to have get data you know, younger, but there's a bunch of, it's, it can be much more challenging to do and we're not able to do it. Um, okay. Lastly, I wanted to talk about community engagement. And by this, I mean engagement with local groups and organizations. Even with the barriers we've been discussing, Black participants were about one third more likely than other participants to seek out and join a local non-religious or secular organization in their community which is much more likely. So you see the, the difference, we have a chart on the left side. Uh, they were, black participants were about 26.9% of the participants participated in local groups uh, compared to about 21.9% of, of all participants. So they were more likely to participate in local communities. And those that did so, there was, it was associated with, you know, more positive psychological outcomes. Those who did so, members were one third less likely to have likely depression, and also members were um, slightly, slightly less lonely on average than non-members. We also asked what types of local activities respondents participated in with local groups, and Black respondents were more likely to say they were participated in social and volunteer activities in other participants. So that's, um, and all this, there's more charts on that in the report. We go into greater detail on those issues. But this helps show the importance of, of non-religious communities and especially inclusive non-religious communities because there's obviously an interest from Black non-religious people to be engaged in these um, communities. And it is beneficial for, for them as well. Um, so at least that's what our data shows us. And with that, I would love to talk more about that issue with Sandria. So I'll stop now and pass it along. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to chat with you all tonight. This was, um, 
it wasn't news to me, the data that was presented, but it definitely validated what I see in my work every day and what I experienced in my personal life as a person who has um, left religion. As mentioned before, I'm a preacher's kid from the South. Um, my mother, my father, my brother, my uncles, my aunties, <laughs> everybody um, is in ministry. And then there's me. So I experienced a lot of what was shared here in this report. Um, Black people have a very unique relationship with religion. It's, it's been billed as the answer to soothe and comfort, to uh, protect and provide, to uh, offer community and support. It's, it's the place where we've been told, this is where you find love. This is where you find connection. And whether or not that was true, um, many of us were born into it or we were at least, we bought into it, right? We bought into it as truth. So it's no wonder that people would be reluctant to come forward for fear of losing family and friends, which is, which is heavy after losing faith, losing religion, something that probably meant very, very much to, to them. And it definitely meant a lot to me before walking away. Um, I experienced tremendous grief, loneliness, um, feeling misunderstood myself <laughs> and then misunderstood by the people that I loved. And it seems easier to conceal. The report talks, talks about that um, at length, how that concealment creates loneliness and depression and isolation. And, and it's real. You know, the holidays are approaching. And um, I remember when I first started to leave religion and I didn't want to tell anybody, didn't want to talk about it. I knew how to play the role, right? I knew how to pray. I knew the songs to sing. Um, no one would know anything. I could just fit right in. And a lot of my clients, I see them preparing to do that even now. You know, they're still leading Thanksgiving dinner prayer because something about that seems easier than to break grandma's heart. So that concealment, it's, it, it almost acts as a safety net to protect the family, to protect themselves. Um, there's a quote that I wanted to share from the report here. It says, Black non-religious Americans show that they face a higher social cost for identification with this label than any other group. So of course, no one's coming out and saying, not readily saying that I'm an atheist or I'm agnostic. Um, I remember when, when um, branding for my practice and the amount of thought I put into just adding the word secular to my website and to my um, social media platforms. It took a lot of, <laughs> a lot of thought. And I, for me, I knew that meant potential separation from my community. The people that I cared about the most, the people that I really set out to be a therapist in religious trauma to serve, I knew that this would be kind of a turnoff for a lot of people. And it also meant that I was adding another minority label right? I'm Black. I'm a woman. I happen to be an unmarried mother and now non-believer. And that's not something I would have just, you know, signed up for um, knowing how difficult it was, but being authentic, being myself and being a resource for my clients meant more. And it's a trip because it's almost as if being a criminal, right? A person with questionable character, still being welcomed to, into the fold because they're a believer versus a person that's honest and honorable and happens to be a non-believer. A non-believer. Um, next slide, please. The impact of religion. Um, I do focus on religious trauma and I wanted to spend a little time here because it's kind of a buzzword right now, right? Everyone's talking about trauma and being traumatized. And, I, and it's important to note that everyone that experiences religion and leaves is not traumatized. Everyone that experiences a traumatic situation is not traumatized. Um, trauma is, is the nervous system responding to a traumatic, a stressful situation. It's when something happens too much, too fast, too soon, too early. Um, at, when we look at it in a religious context, think about children. If any of you were anything like me, I was born into it, right? So 
at the age when you're developing, you're, you're curious and you're learning at a rapid, rapid rate, instead of that curiosity being welcomed and nurtured, you're given the answers, right? This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is how we think. This is how we marry. This is what sex is. This is who women are. This is who men are. This is how we raise our children. This is what we do with our money. Everything was given to us. So we weren't allowed to explore. We weren't allowed to kind of, you know, bump the knee and, and figure out what works and what doesn't work for us. And that, that speaks to being uh, traumatized. Those systems are shut down and the body is looking for safety. And you, you've probably heard some of this, looking for safety may look like running away, fleeing. It may look like fighting. It may look like shutting down completely. It may look like um, just a collapse, a giving up. Um, but again, it, it's not everybody is traumatized. Hi, Ariel, this is your story. Yeah, yeah, not everyone's traumatized. Um, another uh, uh, disorder that I see often in my practice is um, adjustment syndrome. Um, this is more prevalent in children, um, but I see it often in my practice specifically because a lot of this religious indoctrination happens so early in life, right? Again, that development is interrupted. The curiosity to play, to discover is interrupted. So my clients end up being super embarrassed and feel like they've missed out on life. They feel behind, they're trying to catch up. Um, they're learning to make decisions and, and trust themselves often for the first time. Um, skills that they wish they were given an opportunity to practice and participate in early on, they're just now doing in 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50 year olds, you know? Age doesn't matter when, when, you, when you come to um, some sort of enlightenment and start to choose life for yourself, it's just where you are. But these things still kind of reside, uh, has a residual effect on us and how we navigate life. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, let me add one more thing um, as it relates to the impact. Um, other ways that uh, religious trauma or religious, strict religious upbringing may impact our mental health, depression, anxiety, codependency, communication deficiencies, um, a lack of boundaries, sex and sexuality. Again, all of these things were touched um, as we were taught in our religious environments. So it's no wonder that as we leave, we're having to, to kind of deconstruct and figure out what works for us now, what's true, what's real, what resonates and what parts of that no longer serve us. So how does therapy help? Um, here's another quote I wanted to share from the report. Since Black participants are less likely to have any part of their lives where they feel comfortable discussing their non-religious beliefs. And that's what I provide in therapy. That's what a lot of my colleagues provide, a safe place where clients can be heard and understood, where they can be validated, where you know, they can tell their stories, they can cry, they can be angry and not be told to go read the Bible, right? To go back to God, your, 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 your faith is weak, you need to pray some more. That's not what we do. We honor what happens in people's lives. We honor those stories. We give them voice, we give them space um, and we advocate from, for our clients. We also provide psychoeducation. Yeah, you can stay there for a second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we also provide psychoeducation to help understand what has happened and what is happening. And that goes back to trauma, adjustment syndrome, codependency, um, issues around sex and sexuality. We get to look at how were you introduced to these subjects? How, how were you impacted? Um, we talk a lot about purity culture, right? Where you know, these young girls were quote unquote married to God and married to their fathers. And then on the wedding day, like, like, a, like a flip of a light switch, you're supposed to be ready to have sex and to um, find some kind of enjoyment in that. If that was even allowed, sometimes it's just a job, right? So these are the things that we talk through and work through and try to create a different foundation, a, get a different starting point. Um, another thing that we do is provide tools. Understanding um, 
what you have experienced and how that's impacting you helps us then to move to accepting that this is where we are and here's what we can do to heal. We go through coping skills. We learn how to honor and calm our traumatized nervous system. We, uh, we learn how to connect to ourself, um, our mind, our body, emotions. Um, we learn to find safety within ourselves and safety within others. We learn what it means to be seen, accepted, and loved, and to see, to accept, and to love others. Um, we learn to express needs, um, establish boundaries. And, and one of my favorite parts is just near, kind of toward the end of this work is establishing, or creating, defining new values, expanding community, and finding alternative ways to exist. When you grow up in these strict religious communities, the world is so small, right? You think this is the only way to be. This is the way, the truth, the life, right? This is it. And anything outside of that is dangerous and, and, and bad. Um, and we stay away from it. We don't even know that there's an alternative way to exist. And I find that super exciting when I get to walk with my clients and encourage them to explore and be curious and try new things. Um, next slide, please. Um, leaving takes courage. As I transitioned from my religious um, community to a more non-religious, non-believing, um, really a diverse community, a little bit of everything, what I seem to bump into, and my clients do too, is you're, you're seen by a lot of atheist groups as stupid, um, what took you so long? How could you ever, you know, have believed that? Um, and, and I don't think it, that the stories are honored enough, that people aren't honored enough for the courage it takes to leave. I don't know a person that, that I work with who left religion that didn't leave without deep, deep, deep self-reflection. Um, studying of history, studying of religion, studying of philosophy, studying of their hearts, their families. You know, people aren't just angry and hurt, although those are valid reasons to question and leave any um, harmful situation or belief system. But it's it's a choice. It's a it's a courageous and brave choice to be your authentic self and to step forward and out of religion when that's all you've ever known to a space where you don't have any answers and you're exploring and you're figuring out and you feel almost like an eight-year-old restarting life. I think it deserves respect. It, re des it deserves honor. Um, and you know, talking to, to groups like this, I'm gonna always advocate so that when non-believers show up for the first time that we can welcome them in a loving way. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I guess this is where I jump in. Uh, good evening. It is so great to see so many familiar faces, some folks who I have come across over the past 10 years. And this is, again, for those of you who have been, who have engaged me and as well as Black nonbelievers. Uh, first, let me thank Sandria for her, um, you know, for, for her presentation, as well as Allison Debbie, an American atheist, for co-presenting this report with Black nonbelievers. Um, I think I really, really, I think some of you see the work that we do, and I really, really want to try and give a bit more in-depth insight and understanding as to why we started this organization, why it is important and why people need to understand and support what we do. So for those of you who aren't familiar with my background, my activism actually started very early. I realized that I was one of the very few people in my community who was raised in a non-religious household I was raised with a I was raised in a very Afrocentric household, which means that I grew up early learning that there was more to the Black community than just religion and church. Our communities have always been diverse. 
They have always been rooted in a sense of education and liberation. And when I, 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 when I, um, you know, when I reflected early on, when I learned about the trajectory of religion in the black community, it did disturb me at a very early age to see how institutional it was. So with that background and with my, um, and also for those of you who know me, um, I don't just like to wait around for things to get done. I roll up my sleeves and get shit done. And I also want to preface that um, Black Nonbelievers was not the only Black organization um, to exist before. So I pay homage to African Americans for Humanism. I pay homage to the Black Skeptics Group. And I also pay homage to those who I learned about who historically were Black humanist freethinkers and uh, atheists and those who challenged the institution of religion in our communities because it is nothing new. However, what is pretty recent is our organizing. And it really does come from uh, we are an organization that is for the people and by the people. In our community, we pride ourselves on our intellectual prowess, but our ability to engage, and I'm talking about people from all stripes, really needed some improvement there. So I really want to get into the work of Black nonbelievers as we celebrate our 10 year anniversary all year for 2021. Uh, so if you could advance to the next slide, please. So black non-believers, I'm sorry, I know this, there are a bit of uh, there are a bit of animations here. So the the fault, the goal of black non-believers really was only to be local to the Atlanta area. It really was to try to bring people together because there were other national organizations. And I also skipped one, Black Atheists of America. Um, which was active at the time that I got involved with this movement. Um, and what was significant was I went, I attended a predominantly white meetup in the Atlanta area. And um, I got the same responses that I had heard about from some other Black atheists online. And I, I was very, very grateful to find others, uh, especially as I was starting to re-identify as an atheist as a result of one of my mentors trying to discourage me. And for those of you who know me well, you know that didn't sit well. So um, we started Black Nonbelievers um, to be in the, you know, just to, just to be local to the Atlanta area, to try to engage with the other groups and also to, um, to also engage those Black folks who we knew were questioning or we knew were out there, but they didn't know that there were others. So really trying to bring that together. We became, uh, we shortened our name to Black Nonbelievers in November of 2011 because there was interest in starting similar groups in different cities. And uh, in that time, in that, in that work, in our persistence, we eventually became a 501c3 in 2014, for those of you who still aren't aware of that. And I am proud to say that as of now, we are the now the largest and most recognized Black atheist organization within the secular community. Um, of course, we are still working on data for that. And uh, we do, uh, we have um, much of uh, our impetus for what we do is ba was based on those Pew Research numbers, which showed um, about 87, it, gone, it went down to 79%. If you uh, go to Pew Research, they just released a new study in February of this year, which still shows the high level of religiosity within the Black community. So again, this is nothing, you know, this is nothing new. However, to see the data and to see the information really does back up the need for our organizations. Next slide, please. So um, this brings us to what does BN do? Uh, and, I, and I'm saying this for those who are new, who are just learning about our organization or who are a part of our groups or who follow us on social media. 
but do not have a, uh, an in-depth grasp of what we do. So we do provide support primarily, not exclusively, but primarily for Blacks who have left religion, questioning their, uh, their beliefs, et cetera. And we do host and collaborate on a number of activities. So we host in person, we've hosted in person, we've started to tra transition back as people start to become more vaccinated, but we also started hosting virtual events as well. So we are very uh, community and also socially oriented. We do work to increase the number of openly identified Black atheists. We have had people come to us who were initially in the closet. However, through, through our support, they were, they, they started to feel more comfortable about embracing that non-religious identity. And we also support each other on how to approach that subject of non-belief with religious family members, friends, and acquaintances, which um, as Andrea said, the holidays are coming up. This is very, very important. And also the events that we host provide an alternative to that for people who do not want to um, engage their religious family members and friends, or uh, even if only for a short time, uh, rebuilding that community helps provide that outlet for people. And we also feature and highlight, and we've also helped to produce um, Black atheists, a uh, content from the Black atheist demographic. We, we, like, we, we, uh, we actually exist to highlight those, those content producers, activists, and organizers who might not be overall familiar to the secular community. And I will say that um, my, my reintroduction to my non-belief um, did not come from a Richard Dawkins or a Sam Harris or, um, you know, or, or anyone, uh, any predominant or any white person who you know, would have that, um, you know, who, who rightfully has those credentials. It did come from people like Jeremiah Kamara, learning about Sakibu Hutchinson and the like, and also Norm Allen Jr. So uh, again, there is, a, there are, there is Black content out there or content from our demographic that is still not as well known as it should be throughout the entire community. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so um, for those who are visually impaired, uh, this is a slide of some, some photos from some events that Black Nonbelievers has produced, uh, some, many of whom have participated with us who are on this call, um, in, including the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference, which we have co-produced with Black Skeptics and the Women's Leadership Project. We have also contributed to research for books, uh, for example, The Ebony Exodus Project by Candace Gorham. Uh, also, uh, we have been featured in the media and that will be the next slide. Uh, there are just some, we have participated in marches as well as our own uh, events. And uh, one of the photos is from the 2019, uh, 2020 God Talk episode that was produced by the National Museum for African American Culture, which focused on um, which focused on Black uh, millennials leading religion. Next slide, please. So over the course of ten years, we have had the opportunity to connect with a number of media outlets. Uh, if you are visually impaired, there are a, there is a photo of the July August 2018 issue of the Humanist magazine, which featured the Five Fierce Humanists, which was myself, Sakibu Hutchinson, Candace Gorm, Bria Crutchfield, and Liz Ross. We are the first Black women, multiple Black women, to be featured on any magazine cover. And also the second photo is from the July, August, 2018 issue of Playboy magazine. We've been featured on, on CBS Sunday morning. And it's not just myself, other BN members. This is important because to see and hear us in the media has been, uh, been crucial 
for getting out the word and spreading the visibility of, of the existence of more uh, Black atheists and also religion doubters. We also participated in the Billboard campaign in 2012 for African Americans for Humanism. We've been featured on CNN, uh, with CNN twice in 2011 and 2015. Uh, and just a number of uh, a number of articles, interviews, and features uh, over the years, which I uh, which is still very very important to the visibility. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who weren't aware of our current programs and initiatives, last year we launched the True. A liberation billboard campaign, which was co-sponsored by the Steeple Free Thought Foundation, um, which was on the heels of our Black family discussion about Christianity, white supremacy, and true liberation, because this is still a point that we are trying to um, advance this discussion from the non-religious perspective. Uh, we also have started co-sponsoring the Zora Neale Hurston Scholarship in partnership with the Secular Student Alliance. And in, 20, uh, in 2017, we launched the Being Changes Lives campaign, which is, uh, which is a collection of journeys and experiences from our members and allies on leaving religion and how BN has been transformative to their lives. And this is very, very important because the journeys and the experiences are very, very crucial and vital to the growth of our demographic and the growth of this community. And if you know anything about what we do overall is that we are very, very, we try to be very engaging and very supportive of people's journeys. And it is important to me in particular for people to be able to express their non-belief without always being defensive and to also know that there are others out there who can directly relate to their experiences. Next slide, please. So looking to the future, um, I, we are uh, myself or black non-believers and Sundria uh, who is with My Choice, My Power Counseling is working on a religious trauma group coaching. We are working to, uh, offer that as a service for, uh, for members and also others who would be interested in that. Um, we, can, we will continue to produce our, our own autonomous events, but also uh, to host and collaborate with other organizations. And in this picture here, is the, the picture is, uh, there's a picture of uh, the National Museum for African American Culture. For those of you who are friends on Facebook with me, but for, you may know this already, and if you're a patron of mine, but for those of you who aren't and, uh, you know, and are um, tuning in for the first time, uh, the National Museum for African American Culture recently requested digital images from, uh, from previous events. And they uh, accepted these images from us to start working on a digital uh, book, a photography book, I'm sorry, a photography book of religion in black life. And so they specifically reached out to us and they accepted photos from the 2019 Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference, as well as BN's 10th anniversary earlier this year. And for those of you who are also very in tune with our network. You know that we, we are still working at a disadvantage with support due to these institutional factors, due to the fact that it is harder to, for, for Black folks to leave religion. And so once that happens, there are spaces, but there is still, um, you know, we, we still have to work harder to achieve even a fraction of the support that the other organizations get. However, even with that, we were still we are still able to accomplish so much and directly impact and engage uh, more people. And that is something that not just uh, it is not just me that should be proud of that. 
everyone who is in tune with the BN Network, if you've ever attended our events, if you have ever been a part of us for this long, you should be proud of that too, because this is your victory. When you are coming out of these beliefs and when you are, when you actually engage a community that isn't just social, but that we are contributing, we are making history here. So this is our, this is our victory. And with this information, we are able to expound on that and continue to move forward and grow, but it doesn't happen by itself. These things looking to the future, there, we do need to invest and, and be more proactive and working with each other because these things are not just gonna happen for us. The time for magical thinking is, 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 is done. And, that's, and, and that is hard to overcome. It is a challenge. But knowing that you play a small part really, really does make a difference in the work that we do. So thank you. There I go. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Andisa and Sandria and Allison. Sometimes my Zoom window seems to not work on one of my monitors. I think I got it. It's only been a year and a half of pandemic and Zoom and my computer still aren't friends with each other, it seems. Can you see but, the okay. slides? Everything okay? Yep, yep. If I You muted yourself, Debbie. <laughs> it's like I haven't done this before. Thanks, I apologize. Sometimes my computer doesn't agree with Zoom. I'm going to talk some about the recommendations in the report and additional recommendations for community building and organizing directed to the broader secular community. Now, most of the broader secular community is primarily white. These aren't just recommendations for white people. They're recommendations for group leaders, for group participants, for people who participate in the secular community and online spaces. Some of them are for primarily white groups or overwhelmingly white groups. Some of our groups are overwhelmingly white, um, but they can be brought to group leadership if you're looking to get involved and you're a person of color uh, as suggestions or ideas for ways that groups can go about building more inclusive community spaces. So a lot of us who are not white in leadership positions in this community have been asked by people involved in groups, how do we get more black people? How do we get more X kind of person in our group? I've been asked that since the first year I was involved, which was the summer of 2000, as a 20 year old, as a young person, as a woman. <laughs> How do we get more you in our group? And then for 20 years since, and I've given a lot of talks on this, I know Mandisa and Sakibu Hutchinson and many of us have been asked that. And more recently, instead of going into a laundry list of reasons, I've been asking in response, why? Why do we, or why do you want to see more diversity in our community spaces? Why do you want black people showing up in your group meetings? Why do you think this is important? Like, why is it important to you? <clears throat> and some of the reasons that I think people have <laughs> are one, because when a dozen or more white people show up around a topic like atheism or free thought or science, and it's open to everyone, they can feel like it's embarrassing, especially if they live in a very diverse region. Two, because most of us do live in pretty diverse environments and there are people with all kinds of different experiences and identities in our environment. So if we want to better understand the world and we want to better understand our spaces and we wanna have a good community group, then we don't want massive parts of our community to be missing from our community spaces. Lack of representation reinforces our ignorance. How can we serve our community well if we don't know what's going on in parts of our community? 
Third, and relatedly, if our communities lack diversity, it just means there are people out there with needs, as we've talked about in the earlier presentations and as the report shows, there are people in our communities, non-religious people with needs, and we're not able to serve them. We're not able to connect with them. There are people we could be supporting, but we're missing them instead. So if you think it's good for our communities to be more inclusive and to be able to be better and stronger communities, when you ask yourself why, if you come up with answers and those are important reasons to you, <clears throat> I hope you can keep those in mind as we talk about some of the actions that we can take to make this community and this movement better and more inclusive. So for those of you who are involved with groups, whether online groups or local community groups or campus groups, uh, at the slide right now talks about mission, vision, and values. And that's basically just thinking about your why. If you're a member of a leadership team, I recommend everyone do this. Get together with other members of your leadership team and go through this process of clarifying your vision and values if it's not written down somewhere. And if it is written down somewhere and you haven't looked at it in a while, go through it and say, is this right? Does this actually represent what we want to accomplish? Why does your group exist? Who do you serve? Who do you think should be a part of it? Everyone is not the answer, by the way. Who do you think should be a part of it? What are you trying to accomplish by having a group? What does it look like if you are succeeding at your mission? And how would your broader community look different if you succeed, if anything should change? I'm very much a fan of goal-oriented action and writing things down and working together and building alignment. So try to have a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish and write these things down. If it's part of your mission to build a well-functioning community for non-religious people, how do you do that? And if you're serious about building a more inclusive community and your leadership team is ready to commit, if you're serious, your leadership team should be ready to commit to educating yourselves about what that means to take that seriously. And you should provide yourselves a space to discuss openly and commit to the actions you need to take. So let's talk about some of those prongs, education, kind of commitments you can make, the actions that you can take as community leaders and as individuals. If you had a chance, and I hope you all did, and if you haven't yet, I hope you do, if you had a chance to look at the report, you saw that it includes four pages at the end titled, Recommendations for Community Building and Organizing, it starts on page 21. And there are five categories of recommendations. I won't spend too much time on each because I have a couple more things to add and you can read wonderful words on the page by looking at the report on the website. The first recommendation is be aware of how white supremacy affects organizational and interpersonal dynamics. A willingness, whoa, willingness to learn and accountability are essential. White supremacy affects organizational and interpersonal dynamics. Not only white supremacy, but it's a report about black non-religious people, so the focus is white supremacy. There's all kinds of dynamics that give some people more power and status and keeps other people from feeling as involved and welcome. So educate yourselves about these. Number two, understand that racism, discrimination, and other issues that have a disparate impact on Black non-religious people are secular issues. What it is that we count as secular issues depends very much on who we are. And because we're a community and movement that has largely been white people and men, that affects what issues are considered priorities and which issues are considered fringe to our mission. And our organizations and groups should be aware of this when we set our advocacy agendas and local groups and online spaces should be aware of this when they think about what topics that they cover which ones are fringe, which ones are more core to the mission, which ones are of interest, which ones aren't. That those answers will come based on who's in the room and what their experiences are. Number three, be responsive to the needs of black non-religious members in terms of your activities, your goals and accessibility. For the survey, the black respondents were more likely to be younger, they're more likely to be raising children. And we know due to the history of discrimination and segregation in this country, Black people are also more likely to have lower income and to live in segregated neighborhoods. 
If you're a group leader or you get to help decide activities for a group, think about what kinds of activities you provide, where your meetings take place. Are your meetings accessible? I know uh, one of the groups that I used to attend in Philadelphia, you could not get to by public transportation. And they wondered why more people from the city didn't get there. And I was like, you live in downtown Philadelphia, you don't have a car probably. <laughs> so this makes it a little harder to come to group meetings out here in the sticks. Do you have family activities? Are your activities and the topics that you cover relevant to different groups with different interests? Number four, build connections with Black Non-Believers Incorporated and other national or local organizations that serve Black non-religious communities. Mandisa and Sandria explained lots of why that's awesome and you should do that if you're not already involved, if you run a, or part of a primarily white group. If you are Black, I hope you get even more involved, uh, but it's also great, whoever you are, for educating yourselves about different kinds of things that happen in parts of our atheist community. Number five, provide resources and support for people who are newly leaving religion. From the survey, we saw that Black respondents tended to have identified as non-religious for less time than other participants. They also tend to be younger, so more people, more Black non-religious people are newer to non-religion. And because that's the case, more Black non-religious people are likely to benefit from resources and support spaces that help people deal with the difficulties of coming to terms with their new non-religious beliefs or losing their community or family, things like recovering from religion, emotional support spaces, mentorship, you know, helping people connect with supportive therapists, and even helping young people who've been rejected by their families. So these were the five major recommendations for community building and organizing from the report. Again, there's more information in there, more details about that. I included a couple of additional recommendations, some that are quite tangible uh, for actions that people can take that can help us build more welcoming spaces for people that we don't tend to see represented in our community spaces. The first biggie tangible one is a code of conduct. Every group, and this includes online ones, should probably have this to help you achieve your group's goals. It helps you foster the kind of community space that you want to have. Keep in mind that you can't be equally welcoming to everyone. If you have people spouting sexist rhetoric in your group, you will probably drive away more women. If there's a lot of homophobia or transphobia, you lose people from those demographics and people who care about those demographics. So what kind of group do you want to have? Set your expectations out. And that's part of thinking about your group's mission, vision, and values which should feed into helping you create a code of conduct that helps you get the kind of group that you want to have. Next recommendation, wrapping up here, is building partnerships and coalitions. Of course, this, these are ways uh, to learn about other issues that are affecting different parts of your community. For some groups out there, humanist groups and whatnot, it's volunteering, it's co-sponsored events, you know, showing up for other groups' events, you know, bringing in speakers from groups to speak for your group. There are a lot of very easy ways to make great connections with all kinds of groups across your community. And you can learn a lot from that. And you might even find some new members who didn't know that you were out there and as friendly and gosh darn cute as you all are. So they might be more willing to join a group. Another piece of recommendation is to be relevant. The group might be very comfortable with the kinds of things it's doing, and you might have the same kinds of people showing up all the time, and you wonder, why can't we get other kinds of people to our group meetings? Why can't we get Black people? Why can't we get young people? You know, why don't we have more people in their 30s and 40s coming to our group meetings? Well, <laughs> has your group thought about the needs of these communities and whether they align with what your group offers? the activities you put on might not be relevant for these communities. If you're having a lot of talks about science, <laughs> I know in a city like Buffalo, um, when I worked at the Center for Inquiry, if we had space talks, 
we wouldn't expect people from the East Side, which was overwhelmingly African American, to come to our space talks. Not because there aren't Black people who like don't like space, like or who do like space, because they weren't plugged into a communications network. They probably wouldn't have traveled out to the suburbs to go to some talk about space. But if we talked about like issues that are affecting the community where they live, we probably could have gotten some people to our events at the Center for Inquiry in the suburbs of Buffalo. So if you want to see different results, you need to do some things differently. Try to be more well-rounded. At American Atheists, we talk to community leaders a lot about ACES, uh, the ACES program, which stands for Activism and Advocacy, Community, Education, and Service. Having a well-rounded group that participates in these four things will attract different kinds of people who are interested in these different things. Another recommendation is recognize people of different backgrounds, concerns, and needs, and be comfortable with that different. Nick Fish once said, and I told him I'd write it down, we can't be a single issue movement because we don't live single issue lives. We can't be a single issue community because we don't have single issue lives. People care about issues that affect them and others like them. And last is to recognize that organizing and community building is a skill. It took me a long time to realize that. Leadership is a skill, management is a skill. You don't, most people don't think about going to college for these things, particularly organizing. Some people do if you're in business, but because they're skills, you can work on them and you can work to develop them better. You can go to, online trainings, you can download resources, there are books, there are articles, there are leadership trainings, occasionally in the secular community, there are secular focus trainings, but there are a lot of things out there about how to get people together to work on something, how to build a more inclusive community space. You can even look up church resources if that won't freak you out, about how to build a more inclusive congregation. The, the methods that you follow are the same. The how do you get a community together that's welcoming for different kinds of people? Same with marketing, right? Like different groups can apply the same kinds of principles and you can work to improve your skill with these principles. If you're involved in groups and you wanna see them be different, think of yourself as an organizer. Learn from other movements. Talk to people with more experience. Get some advice, try things, and if they don't work, think about what you could have done better and what you can do differently next time. You can always connect with us at American Atheists, Sam McGuire, myself. For Black non-believers, of course, you can connect with Mandisa to see how to do a better job of building a more welcoming space. Uh, we're happy to talk with your leadership teams if you're involved with the group. If you're just looking for advice, again, we're happy to talk to you. Get in touch with us. Uh, and we might even be able to connect you with someone who's closer to you on the ground that you can connect with them. Um, like a state director that can help give advice. And last, just to reiterate, if you're serious about this, if you wanna see your groups be different, if you wanna see this community be different, if you know we can do a better job, then be serious about this. Take your mission and your vision and your values seriously. Think about them, think seriously about how you can achieve them. Consider your personal values. Is this important to you? Why is this important? Why would you be driven to change anything? How do you wanna see things be different? How valuable is that to you? Is it important to you to foster welcoming and inclusive spaces? Or is this more in the just, wouldn't it be nice if things look different? I wish they were different. If you think this is important, I think there's a lot to learn from tonight's discussion and from the information in the report, different, groups who are non-religious have different barriers to overcome different struggles and face different things because our lives can be different from each other. And making this better, improving their spaces is a process. But I hope you all believe that there are actions that each of us can take and that our organizations can take to make it better, to build a stronger and more inclusive secular community. Thanks. I'm gonna go. If there are things flying by in the chat that I haven't had the chance to look at yet. Sam, 
since you've probably looked at it more recently, do you want to go, have you chosen any questions to ask? I wanna thank all the panelists. I think there's a lot to talk about with this report. We've had some different conversations uh, on black atheists, on building more inclusive community spaces, even in the last year and a half that we've been doing webinars. I know Mandisa has given a lot of talks all over the place on all kinds of shades of this and been part of a lot of panels over time, but there's a lot to say. And we tried to cram a lot of information into this webinar space, um, approaching this from different angles. I hope you all get a chance to look at the report for more information too, and expect more from each of us in the space. But Sam, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Sure. Um, Allison, you can probably stop sharing the screen so we all get bigger on the screen. There you go, perfect. All right, we have a ton of really good questions, as always with this crowd. So we have some going back to the beginning, talking about the data, um, just to clarify a few things. And so that would go to Allison mostly. And mostly they're related to um, the scales for concealment and loneliness. You talked about them very quickly, but touching on sort of what the mechanics behind those questions were, which sure. of course went much more in depth with the, with the full survey. Yes. And then also what does related, what does defining family rejection and support look like? Was it self-reported or was there some yeah. other specific measure? Well, it's a survey of folks, so everything is self-reported. Um, so that's just off the bat, that's just the general rule. But we, uh, there, were, there were several different scales that were constructed and a scale just means like a measure that takes together different questions and combines it into sort of like an independent measure that can be looked at in different factors. Like we could look at a scale, like uh, something like concealment and then see if concealment varies between people who live in a city and people who live in the rural area, right? So that, that's, what, that's what a scale is. And so we go into pretty good detail about how the scales were conducted in the main data report, which is on secularsurvey.org. But basically for the concealment scale, we asked in different areas of people's lives, like with their family, with their extended family at work, at school, et cetera, how often they conceal their identity, their non-religious identity. And by averaging that and taking it across the areas, we're able to arrive at like a scale. These vary from one to five, or one being the least, uh, you know, very little concealment, and five being always concealment. And it's not, it's similar for stigma, where we look at a number of different microaggressions, which I spoke about, and ask how often do you encounter them? And it's again from one to five. Do you encounter them all the time or rarely? and then also able to make a scale from that. So that, that's in a nutshell how they're created. Uh, there's also different scales for things like loneliness. And there, by there, I think there were three questions about loneliness and social, social isolation. And these are, these are more standardized questions that are used on many different types of surveys to measure and assess loneliness. And the same for likely depression. We talk about those two uh, measures more so in the large report. So if you're interested more about that, please, please do check that out. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to go into great detail here because it's sort of a wonky, you know, data thing. But so I'll just. I'll just leave it at that. I did put the link in the chat so folks can go and find the full report and read all of that great data. So thank you for that. Um, another question. So it's sort of not really a question. It's a discussion point, and I have a feeling that I. I know at least three of you will want to <laughs> weigh in on it. Um, and I've seen Mandisa give this talk before, in fact. And the question or comment was, I've wondered why the Black community embraced Christianity since it's one of the main tools to implement and justify slavery. And I know that um, Mandisa at least will have some thoughts about that. So we'll start there. And then if others want to chime in. I'm going to try to keep this short. Um... You know, if if you are familiar with any of the institutional factors that come from uh, being enslaved, uh, the you know the the period of enslavement in the United States, which brought African captives over to this part of the world, and religion being or Christianity in particular being one um, a justification which was built into law 
And uh, this is still, uh, this is information that can be researched as well as being a, um, a source for Black folks to find strength, a sense of identity, uh, and uh, in, in, in some times of crises. Uh, and again, um, even though there are, there is historic, there is evidence of, of, of free thought in the Black community. And I would like to recommend Chris Cameron's book, shout out to him for being on this call. And um, also there's more information uh, with the Legacy Series that is being, um, that's being presented on Saturday by our DC affiliate. So there is a lot to, to learn there. And also I, I wanna keep in mind, I want, I want people to um, understand that it isn't just the black community who is dealing with a high level of religiosity. Um, however, we are the, among the most institutionally impacted by it. And I, um, I highly recommend, uh, there is a documentary that PBS produced called The Black Church. If you uh, would want to take a look at that, um, just to get a better understanding of uh, the impact and the effect that uh, church, the church has had on, um, on our communities. So we just don't throw, we acknowledge the historical aspect and presence, but we also do offer that, that critique and that insight as to why it has particularly been problematic for Black communities. And hopefully it gives a better understanding what we're up against as an, or, as an organization, as a demographic, how deeply ingrained it is because there are so many folks who leave church, but they, they leave religion, but they take, it, they take the church with them. And so it is harder at times, it is more challenging. So just taking that into perspective, and I won't get, um, I won't go to because we could be here all night talking about this, but I'll stop there. I, I would just add just the historical trauma aspect. Um, trauma informs our behavior. Trauma informs our community. Trauma informs our culture. Um, there are things that we are walking out and living we see as truth we see as necessities, and they really just might be an effect of trauma. Um, we have been led to believe that the church is the source of truth, the source of love, the source of safety. And if you go back to the um, uh, period of slavery where enslaved folks were taught to read using the Bible, and there was a sense of safety gained in worshiping together and having a place to hide out. We talk about the Underground Railroad. We talk about um, food and shelter. Again, community, these were, these were necessity for life, right? So there's, there's two things happening there. There's, there's a belief system and then there's real life that's happening and we, often don't question it. We don't pull those things apart. A lot of the work that I do and working with my clients around trauma is we put so much emphasis on religion and church and I teach my clients to unravel it all. Let's look at this bit by bit, piece by piece. Is there some sense of spirituality that you need to connect to? And does it have to be at the church? What's the real impact? What are you really benefiting from being silenced, um, giving all your money there? Um, are, are they really meeting your needs? Could you do the same thing? Could this loving, caring person that cares about community and feels like church is the only way to do that, could that be done somewhere else? Sometimes it's a matter of just not questioning it because it's worked for so long. It worked for mom and them, it's working for me. Um, and also we're not talking about it. A lot of my clients, when I ask, what does your community look like? Well, a lot of my friends don't really go to church. You know, we're the social Christians, we're the holiday Christians, but they're not really in it. We're not talking. I can talk to the same three people and they all say we don't go to church, but they're not telling each other, right? So the only time they really communicate is on Christmas or on holidays on these around church, but to get together just because, to pull your, pull your money and resources together just because to really impact communities and change lives, 
it doesn't happen as much because church kind of has the the monopoly on it. Debbie's nodding along. Anything to add, Debbie? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a lot that can be said that was covered wonderfully. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So our next um, question, I always like to end. We're, we're running close on time because you guys did such a great job. And so I always like to end with now what question at the end of, of these things. So what's the next step? And this question came in. And it's the economic well being of Black people is much lower than that of white people. And many Black non believer folks experience family rejection. So they may be even worse off. What kind of policies and sort of grassroots actions should secular orgs be doing in support at the national and state levels? So that one goes to Allison, probably primarily, but also to other folks on the call as well. I'm going to admit, Sam, that I was actually reading chat when you were saying that last part. Could you <laughs> uh, say that one more time? Policies that secular orgs should support at the national or state levels to kind of impact these types of um, things we've been talking about tonight. That is a great question. And it's actually one of the questions we looked at in detail in the data, in the report, because we, you know, we're interested in that too, because there's there's a lot of people who have different ideas about what is a secular issue. As Debbie was talking about this in, in, in her part, um, you know, and we asked the, all the participants of the U.S. Secular Survey, like, what are the what are issues that are most important to you? And secondly, what are the issues that you think uh, secular organizations should be working on? And it, you know, there was a, I think the top three we saw the one that the top one that was the highest among everybody was. Um, making sure that we have uh, public education that is well-funded, well-funded public education. So making sure that public education is accessible and well-funded. So that's that was the primary for everyone, but there were other variants in the top three. The second, I think one was around um, making sure people have access to abortion and contraception. Um, and then three, addressing religious um, harms caused by religion in our society. So those were some of the top three, but there were others and they varied quite a lot by, oh, and addressing religion, um, I'm sorry, addressing religion-based discrimination. Those were all in the top three, but the others vary a lot by individual groups. And we did talk about this as part of the report. I didn't bring it up today because I figured we didn't want to cover every stat in the report, but I encourage you to read that chapter of the Black Non-Religious Report as well. Uh, and we talked about where there's differences between different um, groups. Like for example, the black participants were more, more likely to say that they were concerned about international religious freedom than other participants, which is really interesting. And this is not specifically about the black participants, but I also found there were people that highly rank things that are not traditionally seen as being um, about secular issues than they think that secular organizations should be working on. One is climate change. They thought uh, we had a many, many participants that ranked very, very highly as a key priority issue that secular organizations should be working on, even though that's not traditionally thought of as a sort of secular issue by many people. On the other hand, the issue that ranked lowest just about in every demographic was like addressing like things like religious displays on public land. So like, the, the number one thing that people think about when they think about atheist activism was actually linked lowest by everybody. So I, I just, you know, I think I just think this goes to the fact that we have to like rethink what we mean by secular advocacy and we need to think about what is important to us as secular people. Um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Excellent. And then the one last question that we have is, how will people find out more, Mandisa and Sandria, about your joint projects? Where can they get hooked into what you all are working on? Uh, <clears throat> so if you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we've posted the link to the questionnaire uh, for people who are interested. Um, we are going to review the responses, and once we uh, once we have seen that we've uh, gauged the interest, then we are going to post the um, we're, we're going to post the signups on on our website and on our meetups. Um, if you are not uh, if you are not a member of any of our affiliates, I highly recommend you join. 
especially since we have uh, started transitioning to virtual meetings and virtual events. So, um, which is how uh, the the group coaching. Well, I'll, I'll let I can I'll let Andrea if you want to elaborate more on that. But we have been getting the word out there. I strongly recommend that you follow us everywhere on social media because we are getting the word out there. I think this just summed it. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, as I mentioned at the beginning, I will send out an email to everybody that registered for this with a bunch of follow-up material so we can make sure that's in there. Go ahead. Perfect. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. And then if there's anything you want to drop in the chat, folks can, can grab that from there right now too. Excellent. Well, we are a few minutes over time, which is a which is a good thing, I think. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Um, everyone on our panel, obviously, and then obvious uh, all the folks who joined us from across the country tonight. And um, we will get the recording out to you and all of these follow up materials. Please do go look at both the reports. And there's also a youth report, which we didn't mention here, that has some interesting data as well. Um, and then we will be putting out more reports in the future. We're gonna be doing one on LGBTQ folks and one on women in the next year. So we have a lot of really great data to share with you all. And definitely follow up. I saw a lot of folks in the chat talking about they don't have groups here and they don't have groups there. Follow up with Mandisa. If there is not a group where you want there to be a group, go start it. That's how I got involved in this back in 2013. There wasn't a group in Southern Maryland. I started one. Um, start, ahead, it and start it and maintain it. That is the thing. Like Debbie said, organizing is a skill. It takes dedication. Sometimes it can get tedious. It can be exhausting. I think some of us make it look easy. And, but we do support each other on it. Be ready to roll up your sleeves and get involved. I cannot stress that enough. I think it's a perfect place to end, frankly. So, but that's me. So if anyone else has any last minute words, go ahead and otherwise we will sign off for the night. Debbie? Yeah. I was gonna say thanks. I know that for panels like this, uh, you know, we weigh in as somewhat experts, but there's also a lot to learn in between us and from the questions and the feedback from the audience. That just makes this, a, I think, a very rich kind of experience that I really appreciate. I have a lot of ideas flying around in my head now. So I wanna thank also everyone for coming. And again, a personal thank you for, to the panelists for participating in this. And for Allison too, for you know helping coordinate the original secular survey and all these spin-off reports. This is a lot, and there's amazing stuff coming out of it. So thanks to everyone, and have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>